Good morning, afternoon, and evening. We have everything today. Hmm? Uh, so this is the second of five thematic Global South Interregional Youth Webinars that are organized by Citizens Platform on Climate Change and Sustainable World with the support of UNESCO's communication and information sector. So the webinar today will consider unprotected human and natural resources with uh, you knowledgeable participants that are in Argentina, Nepal, Peru, Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela, plus those that have been coordinating the initial phase from Bangladesh, Argentina, Nigeria and Italy. So I think it's really a very interesting uh, situation. Uh, we'll, we'll have a fast conversation in which you will share your own experiences, lessons learned and, uh, and know-how. Mm? A chat to learn from each other, as if we were, well, in a group, as we are, and to think together how to interact, to put your dream into collective actions. Mm? We all have dreams, uh, but it's a must to turn dreams into actions to make the dreams come true. Uh, we in, in Citizens Platform see this as an ongoing work in progress. Mm? We record it and make of it an information and communication out output that uh, is disseminated worldwide, helping others, uh, inspiring actions and leadership. Uh, we, we, we do expect that, that this will also expand, I mean, this incipient but already significant network. Because if you, if you think, uh, including CP staff and regional coordinators, we are around 30 of us together uh, from Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean, and the small island states and South Asia. So the five of you meeting today are Shichila Acharya in Nepal, Christian Zakur in Trinidad and Tobago, Daniel Cáceres in Peru, though, though, though he's in Glasgow, uh, Priscilla Bulnes and Bruno Silote in Argentina, and Diana Corona in Venezuela, mm, that will exchange information, ongoing actions and know-how on ancestral human knowledge uh, that is needed to reverse climate change, gold, lithium, oceans and seas, and natural resources in the Caribbean islands. Um, Alessandra Bonanomi, Paola Mandeli, and Saif Islam in Italy and UK are part of CP's team. And uh, Ozzy Otsemboror, Patricio Porta, and Monoron Pollock, respectively, in Nigeria, Argentina, and Bangladesh, have worked with Citizens Platform and are working to contact you and organize an initial regional webinars. So let me start an initial first round of questions with uh, Shilshila in Nepal, who specializes on climate, waste and environmental services. And uh, her no knowledge comprises environmental education, environmental policy and consulting, sustainable development, recycling and waste management and reduction. Uh, but Shilshila has been studying from the perspective of curving the climate change threaten, the ancestral and environment caring practice and knowledge of Nepal's original populations, I mean, ancestral populations. So I would like to ask you, Shilshila, uh, you believe uh, that, as, as you believe that this know-how should be known and used to reverse uh, climate change, what are you doing on this regard and with what difficulties and what results? Yeah, um, as we talk more and more about, you know, technology helping us to solve, you know, climate crisis and, uh, you know, we also talk a lot about, you know, technology transfers from developed countries to countries like ours. My increasing realization is that there are so many technologies, you know, science based technologies that are already within our population that we can harness within ourselves for that we don't need any external people to help us right it's within that population so i believe that it's increasingly believe that you know like most of the technology can come from within ourselves in countries like nepal and 
uh, every other country, every region where uh, this kind of knowledge is present in indigenous communities. And uh, for that, in Nepal, what we're trying to do is trying to change the mindsets of people because um, the mindset uh, lately in at least one generation, our parents' generation has been that, you know, uh, we, ne Nepal is a very poor country. We lack money, we lack resources. You know, everything is good about the Western countries and we need to learn everything from them. Their lifestyle is good. Everything went in that wrong direction, I believe. So right now what we're trying to do is kind of, um, you know, revive that spirit and that pride in our own practices and um, our knowledge. So uh, uh, right now we're uh, educating a lot of Nepali youths through online, uh, especially in the lockdown. Uh, so we've um, educated more than 1500 students, um, young people, and then now giving fellowship to, uh, to young people to document the knowledge within their community. So that spans you know, agricultural practices and especially on water technologies, Tomorrow on Science Day, we're having a uh, webinar where, where we're talking about all the indigenous water technologies of Nepal uh, for um, creating climate resilient communities. And uh, that includes you know, sustainable housing, sustainable construction practices, seed saving, food, so, many, so much more. You know? so, so that's what we're doing. So what's happening is on the one hand, knowledge is being documented in video, story, or art or drawing forms. And we're also uh, creating a curriculum on you know, ancient uh, Nepali you know, stone spout uh, technologies so mm. that we can document it as a curriculum and uh, um, you know, deliver it through different universities. We're talking with the university on that. And so this is, um, first is the process of documenting itself, creating knowledge so that it doesn't get lost. And the mm. second is the process itself, you know, like the younger people actually seeking older generation and asking them for different things. And older generation actually feeling really good that, oh, these college educated kids are actually, they think that we know a lot, you know, they are, they are now seeking us. And so that also is creating that bond. And um, so, you know, a lot of tangible and intangible good things are happening out of that. And the mindset is slowly changing. That oh, we also had a lot of things good that we need to preserve. And the challenge um, that I've been seeing every day is that, you know, it's so hard to um, retain young people in Nepal now. So we're, we are, you know, we want all this uh, consumerist kind of lifestyle, easy lifestyle, comfortable lifestyle, um, and a lot of not so much opportunity in Nepal and not everyone wants to stay in Nepal and create things on their own, right? So it's easy to migrate outside. So, you know, the older generation will uh, eventually take all this knowledge with them and the new generation wants to settle abroad and the whole link between older generation and the newer generation who are connected to the land is kind of um, you know uh, being disrupted there's mm -hmm. a now the link is being lost so that's the main challenge that i see i see yeah I see. Uh, but, uh, for the work in itself i mean gathering this ancestral knowledge and put it together and and disseminate it you are getting support. Uh, uh, is there a public support, or or, uh, or it's very difficult? Hmm? Um, uh, what I've seen is like, of course, everyone doesn't support that idea, or everyone will not, you know, like your idea um, in the beginning. You know, uh, so it's like, let's say there are two, three people out of hundred who would actually understand, or they had also tried similar things in the past and they could not get enough support. So they were staying quiet. So in every hundred or thousand people, you find three, four really committed people. So these are the people that you connect to and, and keep pushing and motivating yourself. If you look at the rest of the 1995, you'll get you know, demotivated, but just find those two, three, five people and move, keep on moving. And I have found a lot of those people enough to you know stay motivated and be very excited mm -hmm. good good i think it's um I, I was thinking on something you said at the beginning you know this uh, this things that has been stalled of looking abroad looking how others are doing you know and one of the senses <laughs> what we are doing today and we've been doing in the earlier webinars is uh to try to convey the, the message and convey it to ourselves that we don't need to wait to see what the North is doing when we can do the things that we are able to do and that we perceive. And, and then also considering that changes happen locally, 
no, let's say, mm -hmm. and, and not uh, up there in the in the globalized uh, <laughs> sphere. Yeah. yeah, no. So now I I would move to 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 Christian Sacco, who is in Trinidad and Tobago, and uh, and and she's a small island developing states uh, regional um, facilitator for the United Nations Environmental Program. Mm -hmm. Um, particularly a major group of children and youth. So uh, uh, she's a passionate about an, an environmental governance and climate justice and, uh, and knowledgeable about Caribbean natural resources. I mean, I have divided between, not divided, it's how it is, human resources and natural resources, let's say. But I didn't want to put it separate because they are resources and 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 the same way that we need to protect uh, uh, our resources we that resource those resources are also the human resources that uh, we have from centuries and thousands of years back uh, uh, and that we need to value uh, properly so uh, 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 christian I, I would like you if possible to briefly list uh, what are the main natural resources within your region for the others to know uh, and, and what problems you observe and what is being done. Hmm? In the previous webinar, uh, Christian talk, uh, focused on water, hmm? but uh, her know-how and her knowledge is much, much broader. And so it's good to take the opportunity to, to know better about the Caribbean world what are the resources to be to, to care about? Well, the Caribbean is very rich in natural resources, but um, I would particularly like to focus on trees. And do let me know if I'm speaking too fast because I have to slow myself down. Mm -hmm. So, um, my expertise in trees comes from my involvement with a regional NGO called the Caribbean Philanthropic Alliance, which aims to unite um, civil society with corporate society because corporate has money but they don't know where to spend it and we can provide the know-how and the expertise to spend the money where it's best needed. So um, last year we undertook a project to plant a million trees across the Caribbean because the Caribbean is rich in biodiversity and of course biodiversity has a lot of benefits for society in terms of ecosystem services and um, inherent services as well because you know, Nature is nature, it doesn't need to be of any service to us because it is nature. Mm -hmm. But um, they, we have a problem with deforestation across the Caribbean as well, especially in places like Haiti. Haiti has gone as low as 1% of its natural tree cover in, um, in the last 10 years and they're trying to build it back up now. But that, of course, is intertwined with societal issues. Like, um, I think the main cause of deforestation in Haiti is because of charcoal production to make food. So we undertook this project to plant a million trees across the Caribbean, and we actually did it in one year. It was one week past World Environment Day, so we made the mark, and we've expand, extended it to two million now. And we did that by primarily by liaising with farmers and encouraging cooperation and um, focusing on indigenous native species mainly food trees, because that way you can accomplish the food security as well as, you know, restoring tree cover. Mm. And um, I think that's about it that I could really say, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I especially want to bring it back to COP26, because I see that there's been a commitment to stop deforestation. I think around, I don't remember who signed on to that, but to stop deforestation before 2030. I see, I see. But uh, what are the other the public uh, policies accompanying this process? Well, are there difficulties? I mean, what are, what would be there? I, I heard the, the the great speech of the Prime Minister of uh, uh, Barbados in, in in the COP. No, it was so strong, uh, really, <laughs> and and uh, so I wonder a part of the difficulties that come from an international community or the powerful countries that don't care. I mean, what difficulties you may see in your activity locally? Hmm? 
locally there are a few um there's there might be laziness to, to plant the trees because planting trees is not just putting a tree in the ground you do have to care for it after it's planted you have to make sure it catches and you have to water it until it establishes itself there's funding because of course finding the, the labor finding the sponsors even sourcing the trees these don't come from nowhere um from a governmental side um just let me sort my thoughts mm -hmm. um from there isn't much of an interest at least to me to, um in food security in the Caribbean even though we should be trying to make ourselves as food secure as possible um in Trinidad especially our food import bill is higher than the agriculture that's going on mm -hmm. so um Hmm. Yeah. I thought it's all over the place. Okay, it's fine. But um, I have one more comment to make on this. Hmm. So tree planting is seen as a way of mitigating climate change. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I see. Okay, we will move to another one. We move on because I'm not. You, you, scary. you put okay. it together. We move to to Daniel Caceres, and and then we go back to you. Well, Daniel is from Peru, but uh, today he's in Glasgow. Hmm? He's walking there around. We can see him. Uh, and uh, uh, he's a marine biologist and the regional representative of the Sustainable Ocean Alliance, which is a, an organization that enhances uh, caring youth leadership and, and fosters innovative intersectoral uh, collaboration. Um, last February, the organization published the Global Blue New Deal or Blue Treaty with proposals to protect the seas. So we, we remain, I mean, we, the Caribbean is all sea as we imagine it and as it is. So we move, I wanted to move to Daniel, which is his natural environment. So within this broad issue, what is, is specifically being advocated for and, and negotiating these days in Glasgow. Could you, could you explain in simple words, I mean, uh, what, uh, what would be a good outcome and, and as it's been achieved? Hmm? What are the, the uh, what was the urgency uh, uh, and, uh, and that you are negotiating there and that would really be significant? Thank you so much, Ricardo, for the, for the introduction. And yes, definitely, like you're mentioning, Sustainable Ocean Alliance, we are looking to include the ocean agenda everywhere in every space and every action. Last year in the Peruvian elections, for example, we found out that the, the topic that was last covered by all presidential candidates in all political campaigns was the ocean. The ocean was the SDG that was least uh, talked about, that had the least proposals. Even though the ocean is more than 70% of the planet, even though the ocean sequesters more than 25% of the excess carbon, even though the ocean absorbs 90% of the excess heat, and we're having a lot of significant impacts in the ocean, more than 100 million people um, who depend on the coastal communities, like fishing, on living, and all the climate regulates precisely because of the ocean. There has been a little to talk about, and almost all delegations have little presence of ocean um, discussions in their delegation. One of the things that we want to talk about that we're trying to propose, for example, has already been covered, and which is the creation of marine protected areas. The creation of marine protected areas is going to be the way that we guarantee that we have resilient ecosystems, ecosystems that can also replenish the exploited parts of the ocean with overfishing that have been overexploited, and also that can be resilient towards the climate change impacts like ocean acidification ocean warming and the oxygenation. So we're moving a lot of the proposal on the creation of marine protected areas. And for example, um, a couple of days ago, Panama announced the creation of the expansion of the protected area that's bigger than the, the superficial area of the ocean. It's bigger than their terrestrial part in Panama. So it's a big accomplishment. And also together with, um, with Costa Rica, Colombia and Ecuador have announced um, a, a protected area that's going to be Four countries united to create the first in, the, in its kind of four countries uniting a protected area to create and protect all the migrated species, all the species, because species, marine species usually don't see borders or marine borders, and, and it's the first one of its kind. So, yes, definitely the, the 
the inclusion of the ocean agenda, inclusion of the ocean um, NDCs in our delegation, which NDCs are our national determined contribution. We want every country to, that has a coastal area to have NDCs that talk about the ocean. We want NDCs to talk about blue carbon. We definitely want NDCs to talk about the protection of mangroves, the protection of the coastal areas. And we also want NDCs to talk about the creation of marine protected areas, also the use of, of, of ocean areas to, to mitigate against it. And sadly, for example, <laughs> Peru had an NDC in it in, in 2015, and now in this, this year, it has not a single NDC on, on marine uh, proposals. So we definitely want all our countries to have NDC on ocean. Sorry, what is NDC? NDC is Natural Determined Contribution, which is, what does it mean? You know, in 2015, when we got together in Paris, we saw that the globe, the planet was going towards six, towards seven centi um, centigrade uh, and in a really horrible direction. So it was an accord to say, okay, let's go up to two centigrade. centigrade. Not more than two, and let's get the plan to two. So let's reduce our emissions to two. Now, and the way that we were, we're going to get to two was having each country propose their NDC, which is what am I as a country going to do for that? So each country uses nature based uh, solutions, so technological solutions, finance, and diverse strategies, which are NDCs. Mm -hmm. And NDCs get proposed every five years. So now, in 2020, we couldn't do it because it was COVID. So now in 2021, here we present the updated NDC which are every five years. I and see. that's and but now we know that two centigrade is too much. Now we know that 1.5 is the new normal. We're trying to reach 1.5, yeah. not two anymore. And the, any do you perceive any 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 sign that this could be faster than the official and governmental agenda, which is or oh, 2050 or certain things, 2030. Any sign that this is getting faster? What I see more is a bigger urgency than before. And mm -hmm. specifically, what I see also is a stronger voice from um, coastal communities, a stronger voice from, from countries that haven't had a, a strong voice before. Why? Because usually countries felt intimidated because of the GDP, felt intimidated because of their size, and they didn't think they had a big discussion to mm -hmm. present. Mm -hmm. Now, the countries that are like developing countries, they're feeling the impact of climate change. They're feeling cold ecosystems. They're feeling um, um, sequoias, which are like dry environments, and they're feeling this very. Much I see. Okay. Okay. Thank. Thank you. And you stay, on. stay connected, please. Uh, we, we are moving to to Diana Corona now in Venezuela, uh, which is we move to another ocean uh, with Diana, which is the Amazon. Hmm? This gigantic conflicted uh, place. Um, so uh, Diana Corona, that is in, in, in Caracas, is on the board of the Reflection and Social Action Center, hmm? uh, where she's a deputy director and coordinator of the Human Rights Program for the Amazon. Hmm? She also co-founded co uh, Fridays for Future in Venezuela and uh, is uh, focused on the climate debate in her country that include the unprotected resources, in particular, gold exploitation in the Amazon. Mm -hmm. So last time when we met, uh, uh, you, you gave a very precise and, uh, and dramatic report on the on what happens with gold in the in the, in the Amazon? Well, I see a double thing, no? Something like robbing things, doing it in the worst way, and at the same time affecting local indigenous population. So uh, um, I would like that you, if you could brief the the the, the issue in itself, uh, and uh, the difficulty that you underlined last time for you to act where the thing is taking place, no? the difficulty to travel to the places where this happens and to have a, a direct engagement. Uh, um, so we would like to hear about that and, and uh, what, how do you think this could be tackled? Hmm? 
Well, uh, thanks, Ricardo. Um, good day, everybody. Uh, nice to meet you all. Um, to, uh, like you say, I'm working and um, I'm coordinating a project of the Venezuelan Amazonia, uh, especially human rights and environmental rights. Actually, in the Amazonia, we are seeing a um, gold exploitation that is not consulted or were not consulted for the indigenous population. Uh, on in Venezuela and South. That means that this population is being moved of their ancestral lands. They have no rights on other lands. And obviously, uh, we have an invasion of not only uh, our, our uh, industries, gold industries, uh, we, ha we have seen the ELM or uh, Liberation Army. Uh, I guess it is uh, from Colombia and even, even from the Venezuelan population that has added to these forces. Uh, we have seen uh, so many crimes against indigenous and rural uh, population on the Venezuelan South. We are seeing that uh, our rivers and its affluents are being contaminated with mercury. That means that uh, the, the health risk to uh, all the populations, even indigenous, rural, and uh, um, big cities, uh, a population in big cities, will be contaminated by something like two, three years. We have been, we will see a percent of mercury present in our bodies, more than 30%. That is um, in terms of uh, or a uh, World Health Organization is dangerous also. And we can uh, start speaking about uh, Minamata steel uh -huh. and another kind of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, another kind of illness and sickness about uh, this contamination of our affluents uh, or water uh, rivers yeah. and water. Sources. And and who's who's uh, who who's uh, extracting the gold? I mean, are, are these uh, companies, national companies, foreign companies, uh, anyone? Uh, well, we have a, a Canadian company uh, extracting this gold, but uh, it's our government who is uh, promoting the gold extraction and is uh, bringing security to the, those companies, including they are facilitating uh, illegal channels to uh, get out or uh, struggle and get to other countries. Uh, we already know that in Colombia we have a kind of channel, an uh, illegal, illegal channel, that we uh, get out this gold and, send and sell it like uh, watches, uh, gold watches, uh, uh, rings, earrings, something like. Oh. We have uh, tracked that and even uh, so many journalists that I have to say, actually they are in danger. Uh, they have resigned and they are investigating that these uh, illegal channels, the, the, um, these illegal places and channels and ways that uh, our government are selling the ball. I see, I see, okay. Thank you, Diana. We will come back to you later uh, with other questions. Right. And, uh, and now I would like to move to Argentina, Buenos Aires, with uh, uh, Priscilla Bulnes and Bruno Sirose, that are both members of Youth for Climate, which is a, an organization that advocates to include climate change in the official agenda permanently and as, a, and, and as an issue central to all public policies. Hmm? Uh, Bruno is a musician, hmm? plays music, but is studying also political sciences and law. And Priscilla has already completed her studies in, on biology and biostatistics. Hmm? She, she has coordinated something interesting that is called Pint of Science, that tries to disseminate uh, uh, science uh, knowledge uh, on matters such as uh, agroecology in a friendly way, in, in making it accessible. 
and, and one methodology that they are using are chats in bars and pubs. Hmm? So they go there and translate science into something that we could all understand, which is extremely needed and extremely interesting. Actually, some uh, associations of uh, scientists we are in contact with have finally included science communicators, because otherwise the things remain within the academic world uh, uh, cannot be understood by the rest, uh, cannot be understood by media either. And so uh, it, it doesn't contribute the, the remaining in the academic world to all the political work and the lobbying and, and, and advocacy. Well, both uh, uh, Priscilla and Bruno have particularly focused on lithium. Hmm? Lithium, as some of you may know, is uh, fundamental for the production of the batteries for the uh, uh, electric cars. Hmm? And uh, uh, Argentina, Bolivia, and, and, and Chile are rich in lithium. And uh, uh, it has been, it is important to focus, uh, as they are doing, on what happens. I mean, how is it extracted? Uh, 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 how, what situations has created uh, and is creating and how to tackle that. So could you explain us, uh, um, please, uh, Priscilla and, and, and Bruno, uh, what, as, as clear and as brief as possible, what is, what is ruling the exploitation and destruction of, of lithium and what should be changed? Well, yes, um, as you said, lithium is um, a very important part of doing this transition that we have to make towards green energies and towards a greener future phasing out fossil fuels. Um, and for that, Latin America has uh, one of the biggest um, potentialities on the development of green energies. Uh, what we see is that in the lithium triangle, which is the area uh, composed by um, the salt, the salt mines in, in Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina, uh, comprises around 58% of all lithium in the world. 21% uh, of that is in Bolivia, 19 in Argentina, and around 10% in Chile. Um, well, Argentina currently produces 33,000 tons of lithium carbonate a year. Um, but the thing is, we export that, we export the raw materials to the north, to the global north, uh, where they process it and transform it into lithium li ion batteries. Um, what we are trying to do is trying to uh, generate conscience in the political uh, in the political arena, so we can add value to the resource in the value chain. Uh, trying always to respect human rights of local communities, uh, creating trying to create a regional alliance so we can better the quality, the life quality of people in Latin America, generating also a community uh, that empowers the global south, and also trying to preserve um, the natural conditions of this of this uh, ecosystems, which are uh, highland wetlands, uh, which are very fragile systems uh, that we need to protect because they are uh, home to many um, life forms uh, which are unique to these uh, ecosystems. Um, but he may have more information in the uh, scientific side, so I will let her. Well, but before, before that, maybe you mentioned uh, we, we, we are trying, among other things, to respect human rights. Uh, 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 could you elaborate on that briefly? Uh, this means because the local populations are being affected because, I mean, uh, what, 
Mm. Yes. Um, so the thing is, in these areas, there are native populations that live in there uh, that mostly are um, Native Americans, uh, indigenous people, uh, whose rights are not being contemplated in the uh, elaboration of these policies of extraction. Um, mm -hmm. Mostly there are no uh, public audiences to listen to their experiences, their opinions on the matter. Um, and although there are some mediators, there are some people that are trying to um, make them take part on the negotiation and, and on the uh, public policy drawing process, uh, it's being very difficult to, to make their voices be heard in, in the process of extracting lithium. Um, yeah. Lithium is also a very water intensive um industry so so that mm -hmm. in an area where there is a water emergency um is yeah. a very problematic subject i see priscilla no that uh, there have been cases with the communities that the companies uh, which sold this medium uh, try to start the exploitation without talking with the communities so the consequences of that is now most of the communities don't want at any point um, to talk about the exploitation of lithium. So that is a big problem because instead of trying to uh, make a deal with the communities and to, to neg negotiate something, uh, the government has not talked with them or the companies either. So now is is a problem because the community the communities uh, don't want mm -hmm. anything mm -hmm. so um and about the water that bruno talked um there are uh, some projects um we we uh, read yesterday someone about uh ernesto calvo is he's a scientist and he has project to explode a uh, lithium with solar energy instead of water. And it's really inter interesting because water is like a precious resource. And so the problem with that is um, this project is, is uh, it has been uh, tried in a small uh, scale and not in a bigger scale. So they are working on that, but it's, it's kind of low. Yeah, I see. And why this, uh, this uh, e the, I mean, Bruno was mentioning the ecosystem, no? That is very fragile. And, uh, and uh, what is the condition in the places where you get lithium? Uh, because- They are salt flats, so it's arid territory. It doesn't have much water. Mm, mm, I see. I see. I understand. And are, are the, 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 the governments are uh, taking care of this. I mean, probably less in Chile with the government that's uh, there. But uh, what uh, happens now in Argentina and Bolivia? This alliance that you mentioned that is, uh, you're trying to build and to add value eventually even to, instead of exporting the raw material to produce the batteries locally, no? Mm. What is the public attitude on this? Well, uh, there are some projects that are um, starting to, to be built. Uh, actually in our city of La Plata, uh, there is a battery, a lithium battery plant that is being constructed right now. Um, but the projects that are about uh, adding value to that resource are scarce, are scarce and are really in a very initial uh, phase. So um, the other day, the government announced uh, the construction of another um, lithium plant in Argentina with um, the 
investment of uh, a foreign company. Um, mm. But but it's it, it's being complicated. It's it's a Chinese company that is investing around uh, four hundred thousand million. Uh, four hundred, sorry, uh, four hundred million dollars on the construction of this plant. Um, but what we see is there's no there's no concrete action towards uh, subverting uh, the historical the historical conditions that are, that have um, mm. thrown Latin America up and and taken it to to its misery the, the misery that we see right now. So what we think we should do is considering that we as Latin Americans have the raw materials we should add value to that to that resources mm -hmm. and start constructing like um, a better economic funding for mm -hmm. Latin America to to start growing up from there. Uh, do you know what are the countries in the in the in the north? Let's say in the, uh, what are the, the rich uh, wealthy countries mainly interested in in getting the the lithium? United States. Uh -huh. with Tesla company mostly mm -hmm. and European state uh, countries, European countries. I mean, car producers, for instance. I mean, Germany, you know. Mm. I, I think they, those countries don't have mm. uh, salt flats. Because apart from the batteries, the lithium is, is used uh, for other things? Yes. Uh, Today is used for making glasses or ceramics or metallurgic stuff, things, mm. things like that, but mostly for batteries. I see, I see. Good. I mean, I, I, now I, um, I would like, if there are questions among you, um, I, I, I wanted to group, make the first round, uh, also for you to know each other better. If uh, you have questions uh, to, to put among yourselves, um, uh, it would be good. Now's the space for that. Mm -hmm. I think that in between we lost, uh, uh, we lost uh, 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 um, Daniel. Eh? He was walking there inside the COP meeting and uh, with the with the iPhone and I think that he he disappeared. <laughs> yes, Silsila, do you have any question? Yeah. Um, first of all, before I ask my question, I'm so happy that we all are being connected this way. You know, um, we. Um, uh, think of so many uh, problems in our region, but never have the time to go deeper into, you know, what mm -hmm. immediate problems that you all are facing in your own regions, right? So it seems like a very distant problem, but when we hear you, then it becomes very immediate, right? So mm -hmm. I have been wanting to, um, you know, connect with more youths like this and, you know, thinking like, um, you know, seeing how, you um, mechanisms like co-op also are not delivering the results that we want. How can we connect more on a people-to-people -people basis and, you know, increase uh, the pressure on each other's governments or, you know, mm -hmm. everything um, in general. Um, so, so yeah, thank you for this. And I'm really wondering how, how we can continue these kind of uh, things, you know? Um, mm -hmm. like, of course, we all will get busy in our own work. So, um, so even if uh, we try to just organize it for the sake of organizing, after a while, we'll lose that momentum, right? So how do we do that on a um, regular basis? That's my general question to all of you for later. We can do it at the end. But uh, my immediate question was to Bruno and Priscilla, like um, regarding lithium. Um, of course, when you say that uh, the raw materials that we have uh, we should be able to process it and add value to that and sell it at a higher price, which is also true for, um, you know, a lot of medicinal herbs in Nepal. Like we have so much valuable medicine herbs, but they sell, um, you know, in the 
price of uh, like a husk, you know, it's like grass. We sell it like grass and then it becomes really expensive mm. medicine and comes back to us and we pay you know, a hefty price for that. So in that sense, I understand that. But, um, you know, when I heard about lithium, uh, like someone else's environment friendly thing, uh, environment, uh, electric car coming at the cost of someone else's water, you know, um, um, lithium being at the base of a lake and that lake being drained to extract lithium, which is, you know, impacting the source of water of a community somewhere, you know. Um, so in that, in that sense, like uh, talking about electric cars or batteries in general, should we be promoting them or should we be uh, you know, like uh, still discouraging them. That's like a dilemma that I have. Like, should we be, if, even if you're able to value add and earn from that, like, should we be going into the direction like, yeah, we want more factories and we want more batteries or we should say, okay, you know, let's protect the water and other things and let's not mm -hmm. promote electric cars or batteries too much. What do you think about this? You know, being at the source of those um, mm -hmm. minerals. Um, we, we have discussed a lot of, about this because it's really complicated part, but Argentina nowadays has a very complicated uh, economical problem. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think our government is going to prior, prioritize uh, the enter of dollars and money. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of taking care of natural resources like water. So mm -hmm. in this scenario, we have to think about, well, this is going to happen. So we can say this is going to happen when we get, what we can do uh, for this to happen more eco-friendly way. So mm -hmm. it's, I mean, we all know water is really important but mm -hmm. the exploitation of lithium is a reality. And mm -hmm. so we have to be on the discussion to politicians do the, their best. And I don't know, Bruno, you want to add something? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, that's a very interesting question. And, and I think it's the dilemma we have with all the extraction of natural resources. Um, the thing is, as Priscilla said, um, the lithium is going to be extracted. So we have to ensure that we do it in the best way, trying to uh, ensure that everyone's rights are preserved, that mm -hmm. the nature is preserved in the best way. And this doesn't come alone. Um, we don't think that, this, that the uh, solution to the problem, to the environmental problem and the eco-social crisis is in changing our fleet of automobiles to from fossil fuels to lithium cars to to electric cars uh, of course all of this is uh framed inside a much bigger scheme of things uh in which we think uh that uh public transport should be changed that we should promote uh the use of um of bikes or other uh, carbon, carbon, low carbon emitters, uh, low carbon emitting um, mm. transport, um, transport ways. Um, but yeah, uh, the thing is, we cannot prevent it from happening because it also needs to happen. Um, thinking of the of the uh, energetic transition that we have to make towards a greener future. So, so yeah, I think um, mm. we cannot do anything about the extraction, but we need to think forward on how we, how we have to do it, how we wanna do it, and what we want to accomplish with it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, thank you, thank you for the answer. Yeah, it's really yeah. Thank, you. thank you, Cecilia, for your question, because you really went to the, to the point. Yeah, any other question? or any other comment, whatever. I mean, Christian, Diana, Ricardo. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, 
Uh, I would want to ask uh, Shishila, actually, um, how is um, how is the traditional knowledge from Nepal being used to solve, or how how can it be used to solve um, the ecological problems that Nepal is facing? And if you could give me some examples of, of technologies that Nepal has traditionally that could be applied to the eco-social crisis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the easiest would be this and the most uh, relatable and useful. That's why I'm taking this example. Again, uh, with uh, the traditional knowledge on, we call it hiti, which is like traditional stone spouts. So um, I can also share a video on that. Um, it's in English. Uh, so what used to happen is like in Kathmandu, it's a, a bowl-shaped valley, right? So uh, in monsoon, we did receive like 80% of our rain in two, three, two to three months, right? That's a lot of water you need to absorb so that you can have it all year round, right? So our ancestors, what they did is like they forested all the areas in the hills that acts like a sponge when monsoon water comes. And then the water goes underground and then it breaks out as springs or you know, into aquifers. So it's stored underground. And from there, they uh, created like different canals and channels and made it into reservoirs. And then um, it's all again, locally built, you know, local materials, just mud, brick, stones, things like that. Then it channel into a, um, a you know, kind of a reservoir. And then from there, they made like a bio sand filter inside the ground. And from there, they connect it to the um, tap, you know, and uh, and then the water flows. So the entire thing works on gravity. Mm -hmm. There's no fuel, um, petrol, diesel, or any electricity needed. So, you know, uh, it's totally on gravity. And then the water coming out of the tap is very, uh, is drinkable because it's uh, treated. Everything is underground, right? And then, um, and the beauty is that the taps are public, public areas. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the water, I, I love the most about this is like it treats water as a public good. You know, everyone should have access to that. Water should not be a, you know, commodity or um, something that only rich can access. So it's a public space and the space itself is designed in a very artistic way. It, it allows for social intermingling and all. So, and, and the best thing is that um, the oldest hiti that we have documented in Nepal, like, the oldest documented history was built in 500, uh, around 560 or 70 AD. And those hitis from those times are still functioning today, you know? So once it is made, it is made to last for at least 1,000 to 1,200, 1,500 years. And it needs only like basic cleaning every year. We have a special day for that, right before monsoon arrives. We clean everything. And then, you know, like the best thing is that, um, to clean the drain and clogs, they use snakes. So they allow snakes and frogs to mm -hmm. thrive in the stone system so that when they, you know, move between these drains and channels, it is the drains are, the clogs are open. So, you know, like they, they use so, uh, uh, you know, like even like, I was also posting this a few hours earlier, like thousands of years before Newton or Einstein, you know, thousands of years before Newton, they actually not just understood gravity, they knew how to use it for gravity. everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so that's the beauty of this kind of knowledge. We have lots on uh, traditional medicine, uh, agriculture, and so many things, you know, that can actually, actually, I believe that we can show a model to the, you know, highly consumeristic societies, what kind of life we mean when we say living in harmony with nature. That I don't think can come from the Western countries. We countries like ours, all of us present here should be, um, um, now it's time to stop importing those kind of consumeristic lifestyle from North to South. Now we should be exporting, you know, sustainable lifestyles from South to North. That's what yeah. I was trying to. If you go to, to, the, to our platform, I mean, Bruno or, or, or any, any of you, um, there's a there's a one of the videos the south asia uh, videos we had a endless webinar no and so after that we made four videos in one of in one of those where, where Shichila speaks she 
she gave an extraordinary presentation and with a very clear PowerPoint on, 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 on this same thing. Huh? It's, it's extremely interesting. So now we will have to, to close, otherwise it takes too long and it, uh, uh, it complicates making of this an uh, efficient and uh, communication uh, output. But I wanted to refer to what uh, Shilshila said uh, before putting her question about, well, how coming together, what about a network? So this is the sense of all this uh, uh, program that we have started uh, last month. And, uh, and the way we at Citizens Platform can contribute to this, because I mean, uh, it's really good to remain in contact and to exchange uh, know-how, ideas, uh, etc. The way we we can contribute, and we are uh, that's the sense of our organization, is to maintain this communication through reporting. Uh, uh, information uh, uh, that each one of you is producing and uh, managing the interaction among you and, and others. Hmm? This is the, the sense because it's a communication and information activity and we have our own expertise for that. Hmm? Uh, and I know because I've been trying to build networks for, since many years that that needs some sort of management. I mean, people that is really caring because the actors of that, of the, of the network are usually very busy with their own activity and it's hard to add to it a networking or a communication activity. So, and for that, we have opened within our, our uh, uh, platform a particular initiative that's called Climate Change Communication Convergence, hmm? where I will insist in you joining that as a partner uh, with your organizations. And then we will have the people, and uh, we are already having the people, that makes that converge function. And within it can be specialized networks. You see, on resources, human resources, natural resources. Yesterday we had the webinar on uh, uh, um, circular economy and waste management, and it naturally was born uh, a, a, a specific network. No, at the end someone said, "Well, let's do that." Hmm? So this is my my to conclude today. The, my, I mean, sharing with you that this is possible and, and must be done. I mean, like the, uh, uh, and the Global South Network, no, on specific matters. 